Good afternoon and uh, welcome if you're just joining us. We are uh, about to start our webinar. Um, we are going to give it probably uh, next few seconds to see if anybody else, uh, we notice that uh, quite a few people are joining. So we will be starting in the next few seconds uh, with a welcome and an introduction to this webinar. On behalf of the Africa Leds Partnership and the Africa Many Grids Community of Practice, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar or this morning's webinar, depending on where you are. My name is uh, Josh Ogada. Um, I'm the Africa Leds Partnership Secretariat Lead based in Cape Town, and I will be facilitating uh, this webinar today. Just a quick couple of notes uh, in terms of housekeeping. Today, we are going to have one presentation with time thereafter for question and answers. The attendees um, are asked to submit questions via the Q&A button, which should be visible at the bottom of your Zoom webinar interface. Together with the technical team, we will do our best to relay the questions to the presenter, and we will aim to have as many questions as possible answered within the allotted time, which we hope will not be a problem today because we have a generous time slot for this webinar. Uh, however, if there are any questions that we cannot handle live or uh, in the course of the time allocated for this event, we will ensure that these are answered in writing following the event. Just a quick note to you all that this webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing um, it on our Africa Let's Partnership YouTube channel. So please consider sharing it with anyone you know who would have liked to view it but couldn't uh, attend the live session today. Just a quick introduction to those of you who might be new to the Africa Leds Partnership. We are one of four regional partnerships of the Leds Global Partnership, and we have uh, at the moment close to uh, 600 members spanning 31 African countries. And that this membership comprises government, project developers, and non governmental organizations. The AFLP works in close collaboration with the Energy Working Group, the AFOLU Working Group, the Finance Working Group the Transport Working Group, as well as the Sub-National Integration work, Working Group. Our mission as the AFLP is to promote low carbon emissions, climate resilient development in support of poverty and alleviation, job creation and environmental management on the continent of Africa. Our objectives are to promote information exchange and coordination amongst LEDs programs and country institutions that are undertaking and supporting LEDs to cultivate and support LEDs champions across the continent, and also to enhance capacity for LEDs design and implementation on the continent. The Africa Many Greets Community of Practice is a peer-to-peer -peer working group of African government leaders committed to scaling up Mini Grids policies and systems in their countries. The AMG COP, as it is known, is an initiative of the Africa LEDs Partnership and is supported by the LEDs GP Energy Working Group and the Finance Working Group. Our unique membership-driven partnership is centered on peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge exchange among governments. The goal of the AMG COP is to advance the application of mini grids as a key energy access and economic development solution that assists countries in achieving the economic, social development and energy sector goals, as well as their NDCs under the Paris Agreement. Our work plan, very briefly, is based on addressing these challenges in the following areas. That to design effective policies and enabling and regulator, regulatory environments to foster strong collaboration and partnership between public and private sectors. To evaluate and promote proven business and ownership models and best practices to drive commercial viability. And the accessing and unlocking finance, including engagement, with the private sector and developing finance and regulatory frameworks that de-risk and attract private sector investment. Our membership includes uh, countries, uh, the following countries, Cameroon, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Liberia, Malawi, Namibia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Today's uh, webinar topic is mini grids and the arrival of the main grid drawing lessons from Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia. Now, when planning mini grids, developers often overlook the potential arrival of the grid. The arrival of the grid can threaten the operation of mini grids and effectively developers' business models, and thus raising the risk of stranded assets. 
In today's webinar, we will be exploring the different models put in place in Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia that can help safeguard mini grids against the future risk with the arrival of the main grid. We are privileged to have with us this afternoon, Dr. Chris Greeson as our presenter. Dr. Greeson has a PhD in energy and resources from the University of California at Berkeley, where his doctoral dissertation focused on community scale micro hydropower projects in Thailand. His work on policy and hands-on implementation of renewable energy from village to government levels. As co-director of the nonprofit organization Palang Thai, he helped draft Thailand's very small power producer VSPP policies and conducted studies in support of the country's feed and tariff program. As a consultant for the World Bank, GIZ, and ADB, he has also helped the Myanmar government shape their electrification program, which is a significant component of which, cons which consists of mini grids. He has contributed to developing the regulatory framework for Tanzania's small power producer program and is currently engaged in a similar process in Haiti and in Rwanda. He has also worked on renewable energy mini grid projects in Asia, Vanuatu, Micronesia, India, and the US Native American reservations. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Chris Greeson uh, to present his webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh, for that introduction. And it's an honor to have the opportunity to join you all virtually this afternoon. I'm really glad from a climate perspective that I'm able to save on the emissions from an airplane flight because I'm way on the other side of the world uh, in Washington state where it's seven in the morning. Uh, most mini grids start off as small isolated electrical systems. And over time, the national grid extends and reaches many villages that were previously supplied by isolated mini grids. And this, is, this raises a question. What should happen to these mini grids when the national grid arrives? As someone that works on regulatory frameworks and program designs to support mini grids, the risk of main grid arrival is a theme that I hear over and over again, especially from developers. Developers are concerned that the arrival of the subsidized national grid will take away their customers and will leave them unable to meet their debt payments. And this is a really well-warranted concern. When I have observed mini grid projects that have been abandoned, the primary reason was because the grid had arrived. If you're a policymaker, or if you work with a regulatory authority, or if you are a rural electricity consumer, this issue is also of interest because lowering barriers to mini grid investment means that more rural citizens can get access to high quality electricity more quickly with less investment of scarce public funds. Mini grids can be built in considerably less than a year, whereas extending the main grid in many of the countries that I've worked in can take decades. And if done right, there can be a smooth transition from the mini grid to the main grid when or if it arrives. I'm gonna to try to help provide a foundation for discussion by giving an overview of several different grid arrival options. And none of these is a magic bullet, but if well implemented, can offer some relief and help reduce some wasted investment and help balance the interests of mini grid developers, utilities, and electricity consumers, especially if the mini grid developers take them into consideration in early stages of, of project planning. And specifically, I'll be looking a lot at uh, Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia that have been leaders in, in this regard in different ways. We've observed six different possibilities for mini grids when the main grid arrives. Conversion to become what I call a small power distributor or sometimes called a distribution franchise. Um, small power distributor, I'm gonna use the, the acronym SPD. Or conversion to a small power producer. Um, a combination of an SPD and an SPP. Continue operating as separate systems, but in the same village, buy out of assets by the national utility, and last and, and least favorable, abandoning the assets. 
As I discussed the SPD and SPP options, I'll get into some of the technical engineering details of connecting with the national utility, as well as discuss some matters around tariff setting. So just to kind of set this up, um, before the arrival of the main grid, we have two separate systems. On the left-hand side is a, an icon of the main grid, uh, which is powered by centralized power plants. And then on the right-hand side, an isolated mini grid with its own power source supplying customers over a localized distribution system. And then when the main grid expands into the proximity of the mini grid, one option is to become a small power distributor uh, or a distribution franchise in which the mini grid abandons its generation assets, but it stays in the distribution business. It keeps its retail customers and sells electricity that it purchases in bulk from the national grid. Cambodia, from what I've observed, is the biggest example of this in the world. In Cambodia, as the main grid expanded and reached mini grid areas, 250 mini grids became SPDs. They abandoned uh, their generation, which in this in Cambodia case was all diesel, diesel generators, and they purchased electricity for lower cost than they could generate them, generate themselves, um, and they purchased it from the national utility, and then reselled it to their old customers. This SPD model works particularly well for diesel generators, where the generation costs are high, but the diesel generators themselves are not worth very much. So it's not too painful to abandon them or resell them. The Electricity Authority of Cambodia, or the EAC, is the country's regulator. And it played a key role in putting in place a comprehensive program to support conversion to SPDs. It did two things. First, it required that mini grid operators obtain licenses. And to acquire a license, mini grids had to invest in upgrading the quality of their distribution networks and extend networks throughout service territories that the EAC had assigned to them. Grants and loans from a rural electricity fund made the process a lot easier. Retail tariffs for these distribution franchises are standardized, and I'll get into that a little bit more. And the difference between this tariff and project-specific cost-reflective tariffs calculated by EAC is paid out of a rural electrification fund that is capitalized by the National Uti Utility Electricity du Cambodge. Here's a photo of one of these Cambodian mini grids. And on the left-hand side, you can see the diesel generator um, that was powering it. And then ultimately that was abandoned and it connected to uh, national utility medium voltage lines, which you can see on the picture on the right. SPDs are also found in Nepal and Bangladesh and Burkina Faso. Although in these countries, they've started out from the beginning as SPDs, not, not as isolated mini grids. In Nepal, there are over 200 community owned uh, small power distributors, SPDs. And this innovation came about because the national utility was hemorrhaging money in sales to certain rural towns. Um, also, a lot of towns didn't, didn't get electricity. Where they were selling electricity, electricity theft was high, uh, service quality and reliability were poor. And because the quality of the service was poor, often customers were refusing to pay their bills. And so this kind of created a, a vicious circle. Many towns lacked electrical service entirely. And to help address this situation, the government initiated a program that provided 80% capital grants um, to build or, or improve uh, rural distribution networks. And communities paid the remaining 20% of the capital cost. And then ownership and control of these distribution networks was, was transferred to local cooperatives in the communities. When they did this, they found that uh, theft went down maintenance was more reliably done um, and collection of payments was substantially improved in, in part because it was the you know the local people providing electricity for themselves and uh, they were 
very incentivized to make sure that it that it worked well. In Bangladesh, there's about 80 rural electric cooperatives, uh, similar model to, to Nepal. Um, a national level cooperative uh, board called the Rural Electricity Board invests in transformers and distribution lines. And similarly in Burkina Faso, those, there's more than 75 uh, cooperative concessionaire SPDs. In this case, transmission lines that provide electricity to the co-ops are paid with a 100% grant and the distribution networks uh, benefit from a 60% grant um, as well as government loans. The technical aspects of transitioning to an SPD are really pretty straightforward. Uh, the mini grids generation source is removed and then a transmission line is, is built, which provides electricity through a conventional step down transformer that's protected by a, a fuse disconnect. And in contrast, when we get to small power producers, it'll, it'll be a little bit more complicated. Uh, one of the biggest challenges with SPDs though, is figuring out how to set tariffs. So what should the national utility charge for the electricity that it sells to the SPD, the wholesale tariff? And what should the, what should the SPD charge uh, to its retail customers? Um, basically, will there be a margin that's sufficient that the SPD operator can stay in business? In Cambodia, the regulatory authority sets tariffs for SPDs that purchase electricity at wholesale from the national grid. That's represented by this red bar on the left. Wholesale costs depend on the voltage at which the electricity is purchased and also the length of the transmission line. So I've shown kind of one um, example amount, but it, it, it can vary a bit. The regulator also calculates for each of the 250 SPDs, a cost recovery tariff. So uh, bigger SPDs with clustered customers have lower cost recovery tariffs, while smaller projects or projects that have more dispersed customer populations have higher costs. The government requires though that all SPDs charge customers, retail customers, the same tariffs. And this is uh, 450 reels or about 12 US cents uh, for customers that are either agricultural loads like water pumping or that are small customers that use less than 10 kilowatt hours per month, quite, quite a small amount. They charge 800 reels or about 20 US cents per kilowatt hour for retail customers who use more than 10 kilowatt hours per month. And the gap between the retail tariffs paid by customers and the calculated cost recovery tariff is paid out of this rural electrification fund. And the fund gets its money from cross subsidies that are paid for by urban customers in Phnom Penh or, or major cities in, in Cambodia. So electricity from SPDs um, compared to electricity sold in many countries may be fairly expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than the electricity, than the cost of generating that electricity from diesel generators, which varies between about 65 cents a kilowatt hour to about a dollar a kilowatt hour. So in general, uh, Cambodian customers were very happy with this transition and ended up using more electricity, um, which helped with the economics. The next option that we'll look at is a small power producer or SPP. And in this case, the mini grid abandons the distribution network, but it keeps its generation and it sells electricity to the national grid at a wholesale tariff. This works particularly well for generators, for mini grids that had had generators that were micro hydro because micro hydro has zero fuel costs and can generate electricity 24 seven. Um, in Sri Lanka, there were over 250 micro hydro mini grids that were built with support from the Sri Lankan government and the GEF and the World Bank. 
And with the arrival of the main grid, more than 100 of these have been abandoned. But uh, so far, several projects, uh, three projects. Uh, it's, at this point, uh, another 15 or so that are in, in the pipeline um, now have converted to become SPPs. And so they sell electricity to the national grid. And then the national grid exclusively provides services to the households and in the villages. Here's a photo of one of these projects. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the microhydro uh, generator for the 12 kilowatt uh, turbine at Arthurlia <laughs> village in Sri Lanka. And then when the main grid arrived, uh, a transformer to connect it to Sri Lanka's uh, national utility was installed, uh, pictured on the, on the right. And now it sells electricity 24 hours a day to the national utility. On the technical side, SPPs are more difficult than SPDs. With an SPD, we saw that all that's necessary is a transformer and a fused switch to get the electricity from the national utility onto the SPD's distribution network. In the SPD case, it's a bit trickier. The generator has to synchronize with the national grid, operating not only at the same frequency, but also the same phase so that the, the sine wave of the national grid power is rising and falling in, in, in sync. These generators also need to be able to disconnect in the event of a power disturbance, unless disconnecting will make the disturbance worse. Requirements uh, depend on the generation type, whether it's an, a, an inverter, an induction generator, a synchronous generator, and also depend on the interconnection voltage, uh, low voltage or, or medium voltage. For interconnection as an SPP, utilities generally provide one line diagrams that specify the, ne the necessary technical arrangements. For interconnection, of inverters, um, the inverter's software will, will automatically disconnect when electrical conditions on the main grid are sufficiently abnormal. And then they'll reconnect when the conditions are within program thresholds and have been stable for, for a while, for a few minutes. Assurances of this functionality is provided uh, by grid interconnection certification for grid interconnect inverters. And a couple examples are the, the UL1741 or the UL1741SA. The more recent SA regulations require that inverters stay online in certain circumstances, such as if there's low frequency on the national grid, because they help provide support to keep the electrical network um, in, a, in a more stable condition. This actually came about, um, in my understanding, in, um, because in Germany, there was so much grid connected solar that engineers started to notice how oh, actually there would be a problem if all of the, if, if we had a, a slightly low frequency event and then all of the solar disconnected all at once, um, we'd go from a small problem to being a really large problem. And so uh, over the past decade or so, there's been a move to, to, to have these regulations change, um, the standards change for these inverters so that they can keep providing electrical support in the event of, of certain types of abnormalities. Inside the inverter is this uh, engineered functionality that will disconnect in the event of a high voltage or low voltage uh, frequency aberrations or overcurrent. And grid tie inverters also have what they call anti-islanding protection, which is a feature that assures that there's no way that the inverter can operate if AC from the national grid is, is not present. For interconnection of rotating generators, such as induction or, syn or synchronous generators, utilities also require that the generator be able to disconnect quickly and reliably in the event of a grid disturbance. Decades ago, this was a accomplished through individual discrete relays that would monitor separately voltage and frequency and so forth. And these days, these functionalities are accomplished by integrated digital relays that I've shown some pictures of. Um, the, uh, the bullet points uh, indicate 
over under voltage, over under frequency, and other conditions that are monitored by these integrated relays. Among rotating generation, um, this is generators that you know physically spin to to, to make electricity. Induction generators, um, or sometimes called asynchronous generators, are are the simplest to connect. And this is a one line diagram from Thailand, uh, from the the very small power producer regulations in Thailand, where induction generators up to a megawatt in in scale are allowed to interconnect as long as they have. Uh, relays that protect against over under voltage, over under frequency, and, and over current uh, for the phase and, and ground. Synchronous generators are a bit trickier to interconnect. Um, in addition to the requirements that induction generators have, um, there's the need for a sync check relay that, that makes sure that frequency and phase are perfectly matched before interconnecting. And then there's some others, uh, zero sequence over voltage, for example, checks the, the, the voltage difference between the, the phases of the generator. When an SVP sells electricity to the national grid, um, what's the appropriate tariff, the wholesale tariff that it receives? This tariff is often referred to as a feed-in tariff. And feed-in tariffs for SPPs are typically determined through two different approaches, two different methodologies. One is to use the utilities avoided costs, and the other is to use the SPP's technology-specific generation cost. The first is basically the cost of electricity from the utility's perspective. So if the utility wasn't generating wasn't uh, receiving electricity from this SPP, what would it cost the utility to receive that unit of electricity from somewhere else? Uh, the marginal cost. Technology-specific feed-in tariffs, on the other hand, focus on the cost from the SPP developer's perspective. So what does it cost for a renewable energy generator to generate electricity, assuming a reasonable profit for the generator? As the name suggests, technology-specific tariffs vary from technology to technology. They also vary typically in scale. So smaller, gener smaller renewable energy uh, generators will receive a, a higher tariff than larger ones. And this is often you know, put in place to, to support the, the, the building of the renewable energy industry. Tanzania. Um, over time has had both of these um, approaches. Uh, projects that came online before June 2017 received tariffs based on the utilities avoided cost. And this, um, this is an example from, from Tanzania. Because Tanzania uh, receives a, a lot of their electricity from hydropower and and therefore is more precious during the dry season, the way that Tanzania set it up was to have uh, the feed-in tariff be higher during the dry season and then lower during the wet season. Projects in Tanzania that have come online since 2017 receive a technology-specific tariff, feed-in tariff that's denominated in, in US dollars. And as you can see, it varies from technology to technology and also uh, on scale. So smaller projects receive a somewhat higher tariff than, than larger projects. There's now about 107 countries that, that have feed-in tariffs. So this is a, a fairly common uh, mechanism worldwide, especially among OECD countries. So we've discussed both SPPs and SPDs, um, and mini grids don't necessarily have to choose. They can be both, um, so projects can tie onto the national grid and keep their generation and their distribution networks. And in this case, they sell electricity and distribute it to local customers, but they also can sell any excess that they have from the national grid. And if they don't have enough electricity from their own generation, say the village load grows over time, then they can purchase it from the national grid. In Indonesia, uh, about 200 community-owned mini-grids um, have uh, 
been are, are in place where the national grid has arrived. Unfortunately, about 150 have been abandoned where the when the national utility PLN takes over all of their customers, but nine have become combination SPP SPDs, uh, selling all or some of their electricity to the national grid. So it's not a great statistic, but it's it's an existence proof. Another model is what we would call coexistence, um, in which the mini grid continues to operate its lines and its power plant even after the main grid arrives. The electrical systems operate side by side, never electrically interconnecting. In, in a lot of cases, this means that households have two sets of wires, um, one for the national grid and one for the, the mini grid. In Indonesia, there's 40 to 50 villages that uh, have mini grids that are coexisting, selling retail electricity and also uh, with households receiving electricity from the national grid. In Uttar Pradesh in India, mini grids that coexist with the national utility um, are somewhat common. And these were in, in some cases built even in cases where the national grid was already at, at a particular village, because even though the grid lines are extended to rural villages, in many cases, the electricity supply is, is very erratic. And so um, customers, residential customers, as well as uh, customers like uh, the cell phone tower, um, you know, will pay a, a premium for, for the high reliability of electricity from mini grids. And this particular company that built this solar mini grid, OMC, um, serves uh, the, the, the cell phone tower as an anchor load and then provides electricity uh, as well to residential customers. Another possible option is buyout, that the utility buys out a portion or all of the mini grid assets. So upon arrival of the national grid, um, at a predetermined point, the developer is compensated for all of its assets or some of its assets and ownership of these assets are transferred to the national utility. Regulations that are now on the books in Tanzania and in Nigeria um, and that are under development in Rwanda and I think in Sierra Leone um, provide for mini grids to be compensated when the main grid arrives. In Tanzania, it is only the depreciated distribution assets that are, that are built to sufficient grid connection standards. In Nigeria, it's everything. It's the depreciated generation and distribution assets, um, so including generation. And then also uh, for good measure, they, they throw in a year's worth of the mini grids prior revenues uh, to compensate for the, some of the development costs and, and effort that the mini grid has, has put in. I should note that as far as I know, um, even though these regulations are on the books, the actual compensation buyout um, hasn't yet happened. So, I, so these are fairly new regulations and, and have yet to be tested in the sense of actually getting um, utilities to, to make the buyout as the regulations prescribe. And then unfortunately, the most common case that I've been observing uh, is that assets are abandoned. Um, so some solar mini grid developers are guarding against this by building their equipment into shipping containers that can easily be picked up and brought to another more remote village when the main grid arrives. Um, here's a, a picture of an abandoned micro hydro. Um, <laughs> disturbing and, and maybe something that, that some of you have seen as well. So um, what are the lessons for all of this? Um, I guess one is that there are viable examples of formally isolated village mini grids that uh, have connected to the main grid. And so these examples exist. Hydropower uh, has been able to remain financially viable in, in some cases selling wholesale electricity to the utility under the SPP model and um, 
particularly we've seen this in Sri Lanka and Indonesia. And mini grids with utility grade distribution networks have transitioned to become small power distributors. Um, Cambodia was the example that I showed. And this is you know, particularly the case where the generation assets are low value, like diesel generators, even if the, uh, the, the fuel to operate them is expensive. But unfortunately, they're fairly rare still. Um, most mini grids are abandoned when the utility arrives. And the cost of interconnection depends a lot on the business model. So SPP interconnection is more costly than SPD um, because the technical requirements are, are higher, as I, as I mentioned. So um, yeah, here we have it. There, there, there's, there's examples of these working. They work in places where uh, there's a regulatory framework that, uh, that, that provides uh, provisions for these to happen. Um, and and there's, there's an existence proof and as yet not a fantastic track record in making the transition from isolated mini grid to uh, grid connected businesses. These, all of these issues that I've been talking about are covered in depth in three different free publications that I've helped write. On the left, um, specifically focusing on the arrival of the main grid is a, a World Bank publication um, with more or less the same title as, as the presentation that I'm giving. Uh, the URL below it um, will bring you to a, a, a download page at the World Bank. Um, in the middle is a technical guide for grid interconnection of, of generation under 200 kilowatts. Um, this was focusing on uh, rotating generation specifically, um, induction and, and synchronous generators, and was uh, written with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and the Schatz Energy Research Center, um, and, and was a project that was requested by uh, the utility in Bhutan uh, that was interested in interconnecting some of their formerly isolated uh, small hydropower mini grids. And then finally on the right is the book from the bottom up, how small power producers and mini grids can deliver electrification and renewable energy in Africa. This was published in 2014 um, and is a kind of comprehensive book on all issues, uh, small power producer related and, and mini grid related with a particular focus on, on regulation. Um, and is, this book is available in both English and in French at uh, the, the website shown below. So um, that's what I have for slides. We have um, plenty of time for questions. Um, the website address um, that is shown there is uh, <laughs> links to a, a kind of 1990s style um, website that I uh, upload presentations and, and documents that I've worked on. And if you're interested in these types of issues, there's a fair amount of, of content there to explore. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Josh to um, help uh, uh, tee up some questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, Chris. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to all of you who have sent in questions. I see we've got about 15 questions. Yeah. And as Chris mentioned, we, uh, I think, have uh, sufficient time to go through them. Now, Chris, this is a question for you. Um, the one thing that uh, we need to take note of is that um, the participants cannot uh, see the questions that have been asked. So would you prefer that I read out the question for you to answer? If you can see them, you could give a short summary of the question before you proceed to answering it. What works better for you? If I can see the question, I think that would be useful too. So I can, you know, better have a chance to answer it. Should I stop my screen share to do that? Um, well, it, I suppose it might be it might be easier for me to just read them out if you cannot. Uh, uh, if you okay. cannot, can you view the Q and A panel on your side? I can actually, and I think since I'm sharing my screen, I think answer, uh, question, the viewers will be able to see this as well. Okay. Perhaps not sure. <laughs> All right, so, so are you happy to, to uh, 
just uh, give, uh, uh, tell us about the question and then go ahead and answer it. Or oh, we sure. OK. So okay. Um, Charles Sylvester asks, what are the real and key challenges for clean energy investment in Africa, specifically in rural Africa? Well, <laughs> I should start off by saying I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable trying to answer that question because I, you're all in Africa and I'm in Washington state. And you probably know a, a lot more about the answer to that question than I do. I can speak to some of my experience uh, working in Tanzania on, on the small power producer regulatory framework there. And, oh boy, I mean, we, we definitely encountered a number of, of challenges. Um, I mean, the, the initial one was, was that there was no regulatory framework and, and, and now that's in, in place. And I think it's helped to a certain extent. Um, in, in, there are many countries in Africa that, that lack regulatory frameworks that help support uh, clean energy investment particularly in, in, in rural areas. So, so that's kind of step one. And once they're in place, then, then investors can feel somewhat more confident um, in, in investing in these types of projects. Um, when it comes though to um, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the certainty that these regulations will, will be uh, followed, I think especially in Tanzania, we ran into some problems that uh, when it came to electricity that was being sold to the national grid as in the SPP model, um, that, that often the, the national utility company, Tenesco, was, uh, was behind in their payments, sometimes by as much as six months. And that caused real cash flow problems for the existing generators and provided uh, conditions that, that made investors less certain to, to build new projects. Um, so those are those are those are some key issues. I think another one too is that uh, mini grids specifically have um, higher generating costs than than electricity in major cities. Than, and and so it's uh, one way or another uh, for these investments to happen. Uh, the mini grid developers need to be able to to somehow be compensated uh, for the electricity that they're producing at, at fair tariffs. And these are generally higher than, than, the, than the national tariff for, for grid electricity. And so there's, there's um, some political challenges around how to, uh, whether, whether or not countries will allow higher tariffs to be put in place, or if they won't, then putting in place um, some provisions to provide cross subsidies so that uh, mini grids can be uh, subsidized enough to make them commercially viable. Um, next question uh, from Rijan. Uh, Nepal, the Nepal government amended the community rural electrification project with previously oh, 8020 to 9010 community only to have to have the community only contribute 10% of the total project cost. So thank you for that clarification. Um, yes, I, I, I think I was using uh, data that was, a, was out of date. So, so the government's providing a, a higher portion of subsidy on that. Uh, hi, hi, Chris. Uh, just a small note uh, from our side, just in terms of, um, of uh, data protection, we, uh, we've been asked to keep uh, the names of the, 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 the you know, oh, okay, the of the askers. Yeah, okay. but to, to keep those uh, private, I know some may, might be okay with it, but um, yeah, if we don't mind, we can just leave the names out. Thank you. Okay, sure, sure. Um, another question, do utility companies carry out awareness, any awareness campaigns or workshops to offer the rural mini grids about their options to ease the transitions? That's a good question. I have not seen that in, in most of these transitions, um, becoming an, uh, an SPP or an SPD um, that, that, evolve, that involve interconnection have been driven uh, either by a proactive regulatory authority or by NGOs um, that, are, that are trying to promote uh, clean energy in, in, in the region. Utilities, in my experience, have often been 
somewhat reluctant partners in, in all of this. Um, but that's not to say that they that they <laughs> they can't be. Um, here in the United States, I, I think um, so, you know some utilities are 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 more proactive partners and in things like mini grids, like for example, the utility in in the place that I live has actually just built a 500 kilowatt mini grid that is a solar mini grid that, that the community can, that, they, that the utilities customers, uh, our community can invest in. There's a question, can, can anyone recommend a reliable and affordable smart grid technology that will help balance the 20 kilowatt micro hydro mini grid supply by controlling who gets access to supply during different times of the day? That's a really great question. It doesn't have so much to do with the arrival of the main grid, but is, is, is an important one. In, in, in many grids often uh, encounter the situation where uh, there's sufficient electricity for the first several years of operation. And then as the village load grows, either people purchase more appliances or uh, more people migrate to the village because there's electricity there. Um, a, a, a mini grid that was sufficiently powered initially uh, is no longer able to meet the load, especially the peak load. And in micro hydro, which um, can produce plenty of power throughout, plenty of energy throughout the course of 24 hours, is often uh, running into problems in the evening time when uh, the, the peak load exceeds the generation capacity of, of the unit. There's some interesting technologies that can help with that. One that was implemented in Bhutan um, is called, I think it was called Smart, smart Grid, no, Grid Share technology. And, and it was, in Bhutan, they had a problem that, um, people like to use rice cookers and it, and it doesn't take many rice cookers at, at about a, a kilowatt a piece to uh, overwhelm a, a, a micro hydro project. So this grid share technology um, would have people plug the rice cookers into the, uh, into the grid share and the grid share <laughs> had two lights. There was a red light and a green light. And, and as long as the green light was on, then it was possible for uh, someone to start the rice cooker. Uh, if the red light was on, then this unit would prevent the rice cooker from from uh, from operating. Electricity was not allowed to pass to the rice cooker. However, for the users that had started cooking their rice already, um, when the green light was on, it was allowed to um, to to uh, you know finish cooking the rice. Um, and so this this arrangement. Um, kind of first come first serve on, uh, on, on rice cooking, encouraged people to spread out their rice cooking so that those that could would start cooking their rice a lot earlier and uh, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon rather than six o'clock in the evening. Uh, so that's one technology that really can help a lot in, uh, with regards to this. Um, also, the, um, there's some other companies, Inensis, for example, has developed a, a controller that, um, that can do priority load uh, so you can assign a different priority to different loads, and um, at times of of um, relative electricity scarcity, the lower priority loads can be shut off. Someone asks, "Can you define exactly what you mean by main grid and mini grids?" Your optics seems to suggest that electricity networks will continue to be managed top down, whereas this changes to bottom up. Production will be decentralized no matter what grid connection. Um, defining the main grid, I think, is, is is fairly straightforward. By that, I typically mean like the national national utility grid. Um, and mini grids, by mini grids, I mean uh, isolated distribution networks that have their own generation. Um, the uh, I'm trying to under, interpret the top down versus bottom up question. I mean, I think this the, the models that I've been discussing allow uh, mini grid operators to continue to operate as viable businesses, um, but integrated 
with the with the main grid and and have their assets utilized. Someone asked, do you have more analysis of mini grids being abandoned? Like whether it's due to prohibitive cost of repairs after breakdown, limitation on operational competence and more. Again, a great question. Um, my first thought is, is, is to my PhD research on mini grids, hydropower mini grids in Thailand. Um, again, this is a you know specific instance, but what I found there, I was trying to understand why they were being abandoned. And I was looking at things like uh, the community management as uh, cooperatives, um, technical issues, um, the arrival of the main grid and so forth. What I found, at least in, in Thailand, was that the, the cooperative model was not really a problem. Uh, this, is, this is not always going to be the case, but, it, but in that case, it was the cooperative model was fine. Um, you and most of the projects were being abandoned when the main grid arrived. Um, so uh, what it looked like was that prior to the arrival of the main grid, even where there were technical problems, the community cooperative was motivated to get them fixed. Uh, but with the arrival of the main grid, which had subsidized national electricity from the, the, the residents of the community, um, and the users of electricity perspective, it was easier to just connect, connect to the national grid um, and, and abandon their, their micro hydro generation. Um, also, in, in many cases, utilities would say, uh, you're going to have to abandon your mini grid if the main grid arrives. Um, and it was actually that discussion that kind of prompted ultimately the VSPP regulations in, in Thailand to allow interconnection of these. In, um, in, in the Thailand case, there were definitely technical issues that were leading to mini grids. They were contributing to mini grids being broken down. Um, there was uh, uh, on the, the micro hydro um, AVRs, the automatic voltage regulator that, that modulates the, the current <laughs> uh, going to the the field of the field current of the generator kept on being overloaded in large part because there were too many uh, consumers consuming too much electricity in the evening times. And then uh, this, this, this part would break and then it would take several weeks for it to be fixed. And I think um, people uh, you know, were, were ultimately uh, somewhat relieved when the national grid could arrive and they could just make a, a telephone call and, and, have, and have someone uh, from the national utility fix their uh, power outage rather than, than having to do it themselves. So it's a, a mixture of things. But I think arrival of the mini grid, in my understanding, was contributing a lot to, to, um, to mini grids being abandoned. If a mini grid is the result of a concession granted by government, what type of clause could be inserted into the concession contract to accommodate the arrival of the national grid? Should concessions have a safe period in which the government commits to no arrival of the national grid? Another great question. Um, so what we've, when it comes to uh, these types of regulatory frameworks, uh, we've found that um, and, and this is the case in Tanzania and Nigeria and Rwanda um, and now Myanmar trying to put in place provisions that say, okay, when the national grid arrives, um, there are these different options that are available, uh, SPD, SPP, um, uh, buyout. Um, the challenge that, we've, that you find with telling the government that that a particular area is off limits to national grid extension is um, kind of a political problem. In, in, in my experience, uh, the expansion of the national grid is not entirely predictable. A, a minister of parliament uh, runs an election campaign in a particular area promising um, to bring electricity, national grid electricity to that community. And even though that village is not on the the, the, the national plan, if there is a national plan, 
um, still for political reasons, that area is prioritized. And so a mini grid developer that had expected, you know, to be able to operate for 10 or 15 years uh, without the grid arrival is suddenly facing grid arrival in, in a much shorter period of time. Um, in my opinion, having provisions like a buyout clause, um, if it can be enforced by the regulator, will give utilities reason to pause to say, "Well, okay, we'll, we're gonna we're going to extend into this village that had a mini grid, but because because we're receiving some political pressure to do so, but that's going to cost us because we're going to have to buy out these assets that we don't necessarily want, um, or we're going to have to inter interconnect." Um, so, so I think in, in, in my experience, it's been challenging to tell governments, no, you can't expand into a particular area. Um, that's, that's a politically not very viable proposition, but, but instead saying, well, if you do, um, then you're going to have to either buy out these assets or, um, or, or allow them to interconnect. Um, someone see these there's so many questions they're <laughs> moving around on my screen quite a bit from your experience and from the technical point of view mini grid renewable energy mini grid interconnection with the main grid will it work the same with diesel or are they more challenging so the question i'm understanding is is it more challenging to interconnect a diesel generator to the main grid I think in practice, you don't see a lot of diesel generators um, connecting as SPPs with the main grid, simply because the cost of diesel is, is prohibitively high. Um, uh, it, it, producing electricity with diesel um, costs typically at least 35 cents a kilowatt hour, and it's hard to compete with, um, it, it's hard to find utilities that are willing to pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour for, for the wholesale electricity generated by diesel. Whereas um, these days with low solar prices or especially with micro hydro, uh, because the cost of generation is low because there's zero fuel cost, uh, that th those are typically more what, what we're seeing. Um, in terms of the, the, the technical side of it, interconnecting a diesel, um, it's the same as interconnecting any kind of rotating generation. Uh, so it'd be the same as, as, a, as a micro hydro, for example. How clean is grid electricity versus mini grids, even though it might be cheaper? And how does the national grid prioritize and handle the volatility of increasing percentage of renewable energy? Well, I, mean, I think this varies country by country. I think in, in, in countries where there's a substantial amount of, of grid electricity from hydropower, you could argue it's, it's, it's fairly clean um, compared to a country that gets a lot of its electricity from coal. Um, a, a lot of the mini grids that we're seeing going in now are, are solar diesel mini grids. Um, so most of the electricity is generated by solar, but a portion from diesel. Um, it's, uh, I, I think you really have to look at a country by country case to look at what, what's cleaner. Um, how does the grid prioritize and handle the volatility of, in, of the increasing percentage of renewable energy? When it comes to integrating these mini grids into the national grid, uh, typically at this stage, the, the, the portion of intermittent renewables uh, is, is very small compared to the overall generation capacity of, of the national utility. Uh, but it is, as um, these percentages get larger, larger it, it is an issue. Typically up to 10% uh, uh, intermittent renewables is, is no problem um, for, uh, for national utilities. Um, it depends on, on what type of generation the national utility has in the ease of, of integrating intermittent renewables. Uh, 
if if a, if the national utility has a lot of hydropower or if it has uh, natural gas, both of these generating technologies can be ramped up and down quite quickly, and so they can um, be operated in a way that can compensate for any inter intermittency in renewables. Whereas uh, national grids that have um, predominantly coal power are uh, it's more difficult because because um, because coal does not ramp up and down quite as, as quickly. There's a thermal inertia in, in a coal power plant as in say a, a nuclear power plant. Uh, but, we, but countries that have utilities that really have put their mind to it um, can see very high penetrations of, of renewables. Um, I think in, in uh, probably people listening have better figures than, than I do, but my understanding is that for example, in Germany on sunny days, um, wind and solar power has considerably exceeded uh, sixty percent of of the national of of the total country's um, load. Uh, so it so but that really depends. It really takes a utility that is um, committed to integrating renewables and and willing to. Um, get out of the way of throwing up roadblocks and, and really get in the way of, of having their engineers um, think about ways to accommodate uh, intermittent renewables. It also um, it benefits a lot from uh, increased ability to do uh, short-term planning. For example, having good uh, weather data that allows for an understanding of what wind generation is going to be like in the next 15 minutes or next 30 minutes or, or what solar will be like. In some of the countries, uh, Chris spoke of hundreds of SPDs. What happens to those assets when the grid arrives? Um, so I guess the question, in this case, the, the <laughs> The SPDs are what happened when the grid arrived. They, they transitioned from mini grids to, to become uh, part of the national grid, but as, um, a, as a distribution franchise. So they're getting electricity from the national grid and, and reselling it. Uh, so, so Cambodia has, is now in this, in this model where going forward, um, a lot of rural communities are served by these local local companies that own the distribution own and operate the distribution networks but purchase electricity at wholesale from the from the national grid in the event of coexistence of both grids how do you make sure that a household is not connected to both distributors uh, so that's a good question the what in the in the case of of, of coexistence, but uh, you know, electrically separate, uh, it's important to ensure that that in each household there's no um, that that the wires aren't connected, so that so that in the, in the household there's an electrical connection between the national grid and the main grid where where there shouldn't be and where there wasn't a proper synchronization happening. Uh, typically, what happens is that either there's individual outlets or individual light bulbs that are that are wired separately to to each separate system. Uh, so there's a separate set of poles and a separate set of wires bringing in in electricity, and and these go to separate outlets. Or within the household, there's a a a, a double pole, double throw switch that allows the household um, to uh, select for the entire house whether everything, whether the electricity being supplied is coming from the mini grid or it's coming from the national utility. And it can be, the way the switch is configured, it can be one or the other, but it can't be both. Is it correct to assume that every mini grid that is abandoned constitutes a loss to the original developer? I guess the answer to that would depend on, on, the, on the time uh, if if the if the mini grid was abandoned, um, you know, after operation of twenty years, and the and the developer had uh, fully, um, you know, uh, 
earned back its its investments and 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 made a an acceptable profit, um, and then uh, and perhaps was looking at uh, costs to main, maintain it or or refurbish it that were um, excessive and and higher than the depreciated value then then that would not be a loss. But generally, when mini grids are abandoned, that's um, there's there's a loss, um, and and thus like the um, a, the attractiveness of the ability to pick up some of those assets and redeploy them in villages that don't have electricity. This is um, you know fairly easy in the case of solar panels and diesel generators. Uh, considerably harder when it comes to micro hydro, especially you know the penstock pipe and and so forth, or um, distribution networks, the poles and wires. With SPDs, the interruptions in the grid area is supposed to be more because of right of way and other problems. Um, having a hard time interpreting that question. In the case of an SPD, um, the the poles and wires were already there as as mini grids, so I don't see there being typically an issue of of right of way. Um, but maybe there's there's right of way issues in um, the national grid building the transmission network to 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 reach um, the SPD. Someone writes, "I'm missing the option whereby the mini grid operator continues to operate the distribution grid, the SPD, but on behalf of the national utility and is paid for its service." Assets and customers are owned by the utility after interconnection and compensation. That's a good point. So this is um, this is done. I I understand in, in India, for example, there's there's an example of a distribution franchise model where the assets are owned by the utility, but there's a local person that's contracted to um, perform maintenance and 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 collect uh, payments for electricity. Um, so that's that's a good observation. That would that would be a, a a variation on the SPD model, kind of a combination of SPD and and perhaps buyout um, model, where the national utility owns the op owns the assets, um, but is contracting out just the um, the, the 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 operation. It's not a model that I've seen a whole lot outside of India. What's the evolving role of storage technology in rural mini grids, especially flywheels and geographically specific storage technology? We're seeing an evolution in storage technology in mini grids from well, at least in the solar solar diesel hybrid mini grids, uh, I would say the beginnings of a, of a transition from lead acid batteries to uh, lithium ion batteries. Um, I've been collecting data uh, on on mini grids and, and their components and their costs. Um, and in some of the more recent mini grids, starting to see them being built with lithium ion batteries, which have um, some advantages and being able to be more deeply discharged, uh, have a much higher cycle life, uh, which is important because uh, let, because batteries, lead acid batteries are, are generally the first thing that will fail in a solar diesel mini grid. I haven't seen any flywheels. Um, I know that flywheels are sometimes used at utility scale uh, storage. Um, geographically specific storage technology to me seems to be referring to, for example, pumped storage, uh, pumped hydro storage. And uh, that's also not something that I've seen at many grid scales. Pumped storage is used by utilities as um, the most common and, and most affordable way of storing some electricity. And it, it's basically operating the hydro backwards. So at times of low electricity, cost, for example, in the middle of the night, um, water is pumped back uphill and, and, and uh, filling a reservoir um, to be able to be used um, at times of day uh, 
uh, as as hydropower. Um, these, I, I think, I think part of it is a scale issue. Um, flywheels and and these uh, pump storage really works better at, at larger scales um, than 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 you typically encounter in mini grids. Flywheels also have, I think, um, and I'm not an expert on flywheels, but I think there's some some questions about uh, or uh, flywheels are 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 not able to store it. My understanding, electricity for um, you know days at a time. They're they're more kind of uh, hour by hour um, or minute by minute storage. Um, someone asked, "What is the scope of solar mini grids?" Um, so there's a <laughs> that's a really interesting question, and I think it's if if you if you define mini grids to include diesel mini grids, if you look worldwide, the majority of, of mini grids these days are diesels. Um, but the the price of solar panels is now down to the point where uh, solar integrated with diesel saves money um, in, in in many or most most areas. Um, there's I, I would say that solar mini grids um, or solar diesel hybrids are a you know a rapidly growing uh, way of doing mini grids um, and and now um, the World Bank's actually collected some good good data on this. I don't have it at my fingertips, but um, the, now in the you know thousands but not tens of thousands level, um, whereas whereas um, you know, diesel diesel mini grids are probably in the hundreds of thousands level, so it's 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 growing um, and and still very much an emerging technology. Someone asks, is, um, are are new battery chemistries being adopted for solar solar for uh, mini grids? I mentioned uh, lithium ion batteries, um, which we're starting to see. There there are other. Uh, Battery technologies that are promising. Uh, at one point, there was a company that was um, deploying um, zinc air batteries in uh, in mini grids in Indonesia. Um, I haven't heard a lot of that that in the past two years. Um, I think there's there are a number of in, of of promising battery technologies because lithium ion is um, is is used in in a very uh, rapidly expanding electrical vehicle market. I think we're going to the mini grid industry will be able to benefit from uh, you know rapid expansion of electric vehicles um, in in part uh, through the the lower manufacturing costs that that the scale of electric vehicles will provide, but also because after battery packs have served. Um, uh, their first service life in an electrical vehicle um, uh, service that 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 then they can be um, in, in some cases reused in in mini grids. I'm not sure if the economics of that will necessarily work out, but uh, typically uh, lithium ion batteries um, just uh, decrease in in capacity and and electrical vehicles because they need to be moving the batteries around um, really prioritize, um, you know, uh, being able to store a lot of electricity for a low amount of weight, but um, but there's still a fair amount of life left of, in them, even at, at lower, um, even after they've, uh, their, their effective capacity has decreased somewhat. In Tanzania, the law governing power generation management and distribution gives monopoly power to the national utility to distribute power. Is this kind of law viable in terms of proficiency and cost effectiveness and can be recommended to other geographic areas? The law governing power generation management and distribution gives monopoly power to the national power company to distribute power. I think that, um, I've I haven't been working in Tanzania um, 
very much in the last few years. Um, but based on my experience up through 2016, um, the, the regulatory framework did allow for, uh, for, for mini grids um, to be built in, in, in areas that the mini grid developer felt, you know, that they were, that they were viable. There wasn't, there wasn't anything at that time that precluded, um, that said, this is, this is uh, Tonesco service territory, territory, and you cannot build a mini grid here. I think um, it's where national, where there are laws that say, that say that provision of electricity is, is only, um, is only allowed to be conducted by the national utility. That can be very problematic when it comes to uh, helping people get access to rural electricity through uh, these types of off-grid approaches like mini grids and, and uh, even solar home systems. Um, so it's important to have a regulatory framework that allows uh, for, for uh, different options like mini grids to be built in, um, in, in the country where developers think that they're viable. And then as I've you know, mentioned in the presentation, regulatory frameworks that allow for provisions for uh, graceful um, interconnection uh, or integration when the main grid arrives. I've been um, <laughs> talking a lot and just wanted to check in with Josh um, to see if it's wise to continue and if there's any specific questions that um, that would that are you know particularly um, important to answer. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Chris. Um, I think we pretty much got through all of them. There is one that that has come in now which asks, in regard to buyout of mini-grid assets, do you have any experience of willing buyer, willing seller situations to buy out assets of the mini-grid? That's a great question. And so, as I mentioned, the even though the buyout provisions are on the books in Tanzania and Nigeria and, and will be on the, the regulations, I think that will soon be issued in, in Rwanda, um, we actually haven't seen this happen yet, and so it's uh, it, it you know it will be interesting to see what happens when utilities actually are 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 faced with the moment where they write the check for these assets. When it comes to willing buying, willing buyer, willing seller uh, uh, situations, it, it's <laughs> we've got you, you've got a situation where you've got a monopsony buyer. You've got you know one buyer, the utility. Um, and so, and utilities are typically invested in a particular way of, of doing things with, with their centralized generation and, and their uh, transmission and distribution networks. And often their business models don't uh, readily accommodate owning and operating um, the types of assets that you would see in a mini grid. So my guess would be that mini, would, that utilities would not um, be inclined to offer very high prices in a willing seller, willing buyer type arrangement. And so therefore in the regulations that were in Tanzania or in, in Nigeria, there was a specification of the price that it was based on, on a straight line depreciation um, of the original cost of, of the assets. Um, so I wouldn't put a lot of of um, faith in in uh, in a willing buyer, willing seller type model to arrive at prices that mini grid developers would find attractive. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, and uh, you've been quite a troop in answering quite a large number of questions. And obviously, we are very, very grateful to the to the audience for posing so many questions. But I think it's also a credit. Thank to you. I think great, it's a, great questions. It's a credit to your presentation that we had this many questions and uh, 
yeah, we really do appreciate that. We'd like to thank all the participants for the questions they've asked. Just before we close up um, and before people start leaving, um, we would like to ask uh, the, as many participants as possibly can to stay at the end so that we can launch our online um, exit poll, um, just to get feedback on, on the quality and content of this webinar, so that, that would be highly appreciated. Um, I think from all of us at the African Eds Partnership and the Africa Mini Grids Community of Practice, and I don't think I'm out of place to speak on behalf of our attendees. We'd like to thank you so much, Chris, for your time, first of all, um, for the wide range of uh, information that you put together and were so kind to present to us and for being so gracious to answer those questions. Um, we've all had a very enriching experience for the last hour and a bit. Um, on that note, um, I would like to officially uh, close out the webinar section and again remind all of our uh, attendees to please stay on a little bit and we shall be launching the poll as soon as I finish speaking. Thank you much, very much to you, Chris, and thank you very much to all of our attendees. Great, and thank you very much. It's an honor. I, Africa is really poised to um, do electricity in, in, in really a different way than has been done in, in much of the rest of the planet, um, taking advantage of exciting new changes in technologies. And, and so it's an honor to be able to um, contribute in a small way towards that. And for that, we thank you very much. Keep well. <laughs> thank you, everybody.